So I'm um, Nevin Merced, and this is my work. And I'm um, very happy to be here. Thank you, Pamela, for inviting me to show here at Holy Family. It's a great opportunity. Um, my work is called, this work comes from a body of work called the Reflection Series. And it has many subgroups within it, and it um, encompasses about 15 years of my artistic output beginning in the mid-90s and ending in 2010. Um, and it would probably be best to start over here if we're allowed to move around. Yep. Um, because these are closest to the beginning of the work that's in the show. Um, the work began after a period of time when I was not all that thrilled about art making anymore, and I had taken a class to Paris and was making small little watercolors, four by six watercolors, while I waited for them to show up places. And that was the thing that re-triggered my desire to make art again. Um, and I came back to the United States after that trip and continued to make these little watercolors, but I was doing it out in nature instead of in urban Paris. Uh, and started painting the images of the reflections on water. I was sort of obsessive about it. I just keep going out and hours and hours and hours of painting these reflections on water. And then I'd come back and I'd look at these little four by six things and say, what is this? What are you doing this for? And um, as I spent enough time thinking about it, I realized that there was a clarity to the reflection in the water that wasn't there when you looked out into the landscape that the surface of the water brought a clarity to the image and that that was part of what I was interested in. The other part was that it was really, really difficult because the water was moving, you know, and, and so you couldn't quite catch things all the time. And water is never still, even still water is never still. So it was a, it was a great challenge on that level. And um, so I brought them back into the studio and I said to myself, this isn't enough for me. And, um, I need to have something else going on. So if I'm really attracted to these reflections, what else can I do? And I, what else brings clarity to my life? And I realized that as a collector of quotes, I'm always finding these clarifications about life by collecting these quotes from my reading. And I thought, well, I could bring the two together. And how would I do that? And eventually, I came up with this. Um, it took a while to get here. Uh, but these were the first really finished kinds of pieces. Putting them in the folio also brought to mind that, that in fact, I was kind of recreating a kind of illuminated manuscript. Uh, and I, I like that association with them. And I was, and these are painted with egg tempera, so there was that association with the material as well as the fact that I was working with images and text. Um, and making the folios themselves and putting the overleaf in paper, you know, I just felt like a really strong connection to the book and the fact that I wanted them small. When I first made them and showed them to artist friends, I had them, you know, up on the wall and they said, make them bigger. But that's something we say in art all the time, make it bigger, right? But I didn't, so I didn't like it and I just said, well, that's not really a helpful comment for me. And if, if what you're saying is that on the wall they're not large enough for you, then I need to keep them the size that I want to make them, but make them in a, present them in a format that will appeal to you. And that's where the folio came in. I figured if you're holding it in your lap, you're not going to want it to be that much bigger, right? And it's going to be a very intimate experience. At the time that I was making them too, there was the beginning of the questioning of whether or not books were going to be around any longer. It was the beginning of the digital revolution and people were projecting that in five or ten years we wouldn't even have books. So there was a part of it too that was trying to say yes we will have books holding something in our hands and reading it. Something that is not moving and that is not um, constantly changing or that isn't speaking back to us is, is vital and necessary. Uh, and so there is a part of that that's connected to them. Um, I put, I originally put the overleafing on and it didn't have any writing on it, and I'm not sure if it was Bill or not, but I think it might have been Bill who said, you really need to do something on this to sort of bridge the distance between what's underneath and what's on top, and that's when I came up with selecting uh, one word that would sort of stand for each panel, which as you can see as it went on became an important aspect 
aspect of the work. Um, and it was really helpful for identifying it uh, as time went on, too. So um, the texts that I selected initially um, were texts that dealt primarily with um, issues of ritual practices and um, in social social venues, like ritual greetings, that we say hello, how are you, before we enter into a conversation, or we don't say hello, how are you, before we enter into a conversation, or before we ask the storekeeper to give us something. Um, and so the value of that ritual, and, um, and also with notions of crossing difference, um, addressing issues of affirmative action, and whether or not we had created affirmative action programs that were functional or effective, and why we had or had not comes into some of the quotes that I picked out because those were the things I was thinking about. They were the things that were coming to me as I was reading, um, not because they're all I think about. But eventually, um, it, as it turns out, if you look at the body of the work that's here, it's fairly representative percentage-wise that many of the pieces here have the title Heart's Desires and then something. And that is, it's just kind of ironic that that was one of the pieces that I, or the one of the sections that I kind of took off on most. And I use that term, heart's desires, and it's multiple, you know, it's, it's plural and plural. And that, you know, that idea of longing and passion and, um, and enthusiasm, you know, is all part of that. And it seemed that more and more things were falling under that for me, you know, that I was sort of identifying so this one is the heart's desires, and, um, and it is about my passion for reading. And I think this one, you know, that's what the teacher learned. So that one is, and then a couple of the, the 3D pieces are. Um, another couple of these, these two, the texts come entirely from someone else, and they're, uh, they're from a book by a guy who wrote Zen Cohen's for business people. And, uh, and I just, I found it in a Kinko's when I was waiting for my stuff to be reproduced one time and I really liked what he was saying. So I said, well, I'm gonna steal a few of these. And, and so I made those. And uh, this one is from a, a section of the work that's called What the Teacher Learned. And uh, it responds in part to some reading I was doing of a particular author who was also a teacher who was writing a lot about the change of her relationship to education, both through being a teacher and through understanding more of why she became a teacher. And <laughs> for me, it was a really reflective piece that helped me look at my own teaching and whether my teaching had gone in the direction that I wanted or not and how I might change it. So that's what that really is about. Um, and it, it mostly, I think, tried to, I, I was also trying to sort of put out there that teaching didn't have to be so prescriptive, which it seemed to have become in a lot of the classrooms that I would visit, not my classrooms, but other people's classrooms, sort of um, do it this way, as opposed to this is something and you can do something in reaction to that, which is how I teach. So I was trying to find a way to say how I teach also, you know, and get that out there through this article. Um, at a certain point, these became less satisfying for me because I realized that by giving people a right, center, and left, and in this culture that is reading from left to right, or left, center, and right, <laughs> that, that reads from left to right, that that's how people were reading them, and I was making them more like a religious triptych where the center was the centerpiece and the right and left were complements to that. So I pondered for a while how am I going to get beyond this notion of left to right? So that the way that people encounter the text is more personal and individual because it will depend on how they come to the piece, not because they're used to reading this way or that way. It will de depend on how they find the piece. And I happen to have a, um, a really interesting small group in my painting, in my printmaking two class and I wanted to come up with a different way to do an end of term portfolio that we would share. Uh, ordinarily, people would just make a print for everybody and exchange it, and then they'd go off with their little portfolio. And 
Uh, and I realized, okay, so there were five of them and one of me, that's six, so that means it could be a cube. And we all made a, a side, and I designed a thing that we printed on in kind of a cross form, and then I cut it out and folded it up, and it was a cube. So we all got this cube of art to take with us and could turn it in different ways so that you could see the different pieces. And I said, wow, that's pretty neat. And my three pieces could go over two sides and become a triptych, but on a cube form. So I made a few prints that way, and I liked them. And I said, how am I going to do this in painting? But one thing I didn't really like was that it was so cubic, that it was so geometric. And I wanted something that was a little bit more, I, a little bit more organic. And so come on over here. So that's why I came to finding forms that would be three-sided, but not necessarily geometric. And, um, and that way I could give each one a part of the triptych, but you wouldn't know which one was the left, center, or right. You would have to come up to it and just you know see which one you wanted to read first and then turn it to another one. And there'd be some kind of connection that you might have between those two, and then you might pick up the third one, which might take you a while to find out which way is right side up. And then if you read that one, um, that might bring a whole other dimension to the first two, as well as to whatever you might have thought about it before you even started. So pieces are meant to be touched, although I encourage people in an exhibition space to just turn them on, on the plinths. That's why these things are here. But if you don't have rings and you're really careful, or you do have rings and you're really careful, please pick them up. Um, all of the painted pieces are egg tempera. And I came to the egg tempera after working, um, I would worked with it a long time ago when I was a student, but I came to it for this work because it was a medium that allowed me to continue to layer without losing it. And it was a water-based medium. It was a sort of non-toxic medium. Um, that I could keep getting layer after layer after layer and keep the quality and the clarity of the color. Not, it wouldn't get muddy like watercolor would. It wouldn't get um, foggy like gouache might. And it didn't get plasticky like acrylic would if you kept layering it. So it just, it just is a really lush medium that allowed for a lot of depth. And it turned out to work well, well here as well. Um, so this is all, these are all on paper. This is plaster that's then coated with um, gesso, and then the egg tempera is on top of the gesso, and then it's after they've, they've cured for a while, an egg tempera will cure to its own pretty solid, firm um, surface that's pretty indelible, but I've still covered it with um, a cold wax so that it's um, something I could take off. If, it, if they get, it did get dirty from people handling it, I could take off the cold wax and then put on fresh cold wax. It would be all preserved and okay. Um, so of these pieces, this is called Ritual Readings, and that was actually one of the first texts that I worked with um, that was about, uh, it came from a Mary Catherine Bateson quote uh, about a, an interview that happened post-World War II when they were sort of um, debriefing the Japanese as they were as, as we were leaving Japan, and an interviewer was talking to a young woman and said, "Why is it that you, why is it that you Japanese respect fathers so much? You know, we don't kind of understand that in America." She goes, "Oh no no no, we don't respect the father. We just practice respect by respecting the father in case someday we we meet somebody who deserves respect." And I just, wow, that's just such a great concept that, you know, it's, it's confused the whole Western world. And yet, you know, they're very clear. Now, this is just a practice, so we know how to be respectful. And I just love that. And I thought, well, how does that inter inter interact with me? And because I'm not, I, I guess you could say I've had a pretty anti-establishment background. You know, I've been pretty ornery in my life. So I looked back, you know, and I said, well, I'd given up saying things like, hello, how are you, when I went into a store, or even to ask friends, because it seemed like such an empty practice. It seemed to not go anywhere and do anything. And, and so I, you know, it just wasn't something I was going to do. And then I went to Europe, and I discovered that unless you said, hello, how are you, and how is today, you weren't going to get your meal.
you weren't going to get your stamps in the post office because you hadn't done what you needed to do to say, hello, you're another human being, I'm a human being, we're here together, we're trying to make an exchange, and it just changed, changed my life, kind of in the way that that man interviewing the Japanese woman changed his life and his understanding of ours by reading it. So, um, these are, our heart, that's a heart's desires, that's a heart's desires, and that's uh, this painter's reflections. And the heart's desires ones that are on here are, eh, I don't know if I can remember exactly which one. This one's another one about reading. And, and this one's another, I do a lot about reading, I love to read, so hey, you know, they're there. Uh, and this painter's reflections is a group that's about painting. Um, so that piece is about being in a museum in Paris at a moment in time when you know you're in this busy, busy city, and there are all these people looking, and museums are not particularly as quiet as they used to be um, before cell phones or whatnot, and people were pretty noisy. And there was this just this gentle moment when I was in the midst of the Monet water lily paintings when everybody got quiet and it lasted for about two minutes, and then everybody kind of realized it and got noisy again. So it's sort of about that experience. That's what that one's about. So, questions? Anybody have any these? questions? Oh, these, right. <laughs> Sorry. So then it ended up here. Um, I went, those are very time involved, um, very time involved. And I'm teaching at a school that's in the midst of beginning, I'm not now, but at the time, I was teaching at a school that was getting more and more demanding and was having more and more trouble. And so I sort of said, the only way I'm gonna survive being able to make work and deal with the things that were happening at my work was to move into something that was a little bit more portable and a little less demanding. So I went to digital imagery. Um, and I had spent, uh, I had got, had the opportunity to go to Russia for five weeks when I, it was earlier than this, like four years before I made these. And I'd taken tons and tons of photographs. And among the photographs that I took was every day in the morning I would get up and I'd take a shot from my window. And every night before I went to sleep, I took a shot from my window. And you might think, well, how boring is that? Except for I was there during the white nights, which meant that it was technically almost the same kind of light day and night. It's just the light was coming from a different direction. But I was also there when it was kind of cloudy, so you know there were some nights that were actually fairly dark, or some mornings that were dark, and some nights that were light. Anyway, so I took those, and I was taking all of the pictures that you see here, and probably a hundred thousand more, and I didn't know what I was going to do with them. So it was a couple of years before I got to sit down with them, and I said, "What can I do with this?" And I decided to make diptychs out of the day and night, and use text that had been part of the notes I took from talking to all the Russian artists and cultural people that I met while I was on the trip. So all of, almost all of the quotes are from people that I met. <coughs> some of them are, a couple are from Dostoevsky, some of them are just Russian sayings or Soviet sayings, um, but generally speaking, they come from that. And, um, and they're really dedicated to them, you know, in that these were people who were willing to say to people they did not know, you know, the, the, the harshest truths about the lives that they've led. I mean, it was just, it was really amazing to me sometimes. And um, tell us stories that they, that they lived. Like, I can tell a story about this place here and the person who said this, um, which is, it says, you can, you can crucify freedom, but chains can't restrain a soul. And that was, a, a refrain that was scrawled on this wall up toward the top as a graffiti item in the early 70s by a group of artists who were protesting the fact that they were once again told that they could not make the art they wanted to make and show it in galleries in St. Petersburg. And then it was a high tide. They filled the whole space in front of that with sort of fake but real sized coffins. So there are these, all these coffins floating around in front of the thing, which meant that the police boats couldn't get to the wall and get rid of the, this um, graffiti. But they did manage, as the tide went down, to find some of the people that did it. The man that um, had told me about that story 
use one of these. We'll get his name in a minute. This guy, Yuli Ribikov, was one of the people who was arrested, and he was put in jail for 17 years for being part of that demonstration. When he got out, he decided to run for the Duma, and he was a part of the legislature in, in Russia that changed Russia. And when I met him, it was about five years after that, and he was depressed that he had done anything because it really hadn't changed the life of Russian people. He was like, this is not what we wanted. So it's very, very moving stories from these people, very moving stories. Um, then, you know, when you read something like uh, Real Artists Resist, you think, oh, that sounds pretty American. You know, I could go with that, but um, it's the other one. Only workers eat. And the full saying being, only those who work will eat. Artists don't really work. They're parasites. And that's, that was a Soviet ethic. That's how the Soviets felt about artists, even the artists, perhaps, that they were supporting. You know? And so, you know, that's pretty intense. Um, and I like to be able to, you know, sort of put those things in juxtaposition with these historical buildings, too. And Amazing, amazing place. I was totally changed by being able to 